portfolio questions. First question, Mary Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the timetable of the merger between Brit Police Scotland and the British Transport Police. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I set out in the letter from the Minister for Transport and the Islands of the 20 February 2018 to the Justice, Com Justice Committee the joint work carried out by Police Scotland and the British Transport Police Authority reviewed progress on operational matters at a workshop in February 2018 and concluded that a number of significant issues remain to be resolved. As a result of this assessment, the Joint Programme Board was advised that further time is needed to deliver integration most effectively and safely for railway passengers, staff and officers. Ministers accepted this advice and that a replanning exercise would take place to establish a new delivery date. This reflects the importance this government places on ensuring that a safe, effective and smooth transition is achieved, which delivers continuity of service for rail users and staff. The next Joint Programme Board meeting will be held in Edinburgh on the 8th of May. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? A paper written by the British Transport Police Federation and reported on last week found that the merger of BTP into Police Scotland not only risked creating life-threatening safety issues, but could also cost between 225,000 and 500,000 per officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with these costings? And if not, what have the government estimated the cost per officer of the merger will be? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, uh, the claim which the member made reference to, including pensions, that it could cost up to £500,000 per transfer of officer is simply inaccurate. It does not take account of the fact that pension liabilities are met by assets and that schemes are currently fully funded. Actuarial advice uh, shared with the SPA in October of last year uh, states that the pension liabilities are about £97 million and are balanced by £99 million of pension fund assets. So we don't recognise those figures, although I do recognise that the British Transport Police Federation oppose the integration of British Transport Police into Police Scotland. Liam McArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Following on from uh, Mary Fee's question, uh, at the point of delay, has the Scottish Government set aside any additional budget um, to address some of the concerns that were uh, raised by the British Transport Police Association and others? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, uh, for the very reasons I've just outlined to Mary Fee, uh, we don't recognise the figures which they have uh, produced and we've set out the reasons for that. Uh, we also made very clear that the funding for the work which we're taking forward just now through the integration programme is being met through the police reform budget, the budget for which is used for uh, police reform measures within Scotland. John Mason. Thank you. I wonder if the uh, Cabinet Secretary would accept that it's frustrating for the public that there is a delay in all of this because the public does not understand why there should be one police force for a railway platform, a separate police force for a, f a road a few yards away, and the sooner we can get a simpler system, the better. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator officer, I recognise the frustrations which the member has uh, expressed, uh, but I can assure the member that we are fully committed to ensuring that British Transport Police are integrated into uh, Police Scotland. I should say that progress has been made in a number of very important areas in taking forward uh, the integration programme, including a significant amount of work uh, which has been undertaken over the course of the last uh, nine months. Uh, alongside that, there has uh, been work which has now been taken forward as part of the reprogramming exercise uh, to ensure that there are clear timelines for the outstanding work to be taken forward. But I want to reassure all members that the travelling public continue to receive a service from uh, British Transport Police uh, alongside that with uh, Police Scotland as and when necessary uh, in supporting their BTP uh, colleagues uh, when incidents do occur. Jamie Green. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, contrary to what Mr Mason just said, does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that there are still some serious concerns around the merger, especially around issues around ICT infrastructure? Isn't it about time the Cabinet Secretary listened to experts and went back to the drawing board completely on this very unpopular merger? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Presiding Officer, as the Member will recognise, the uh, merger of BTP policing into, uh, into Police Scotland is something which was approved and agreed by a majority in this parliament. I do, of course, recognise that his own party do plan to abolish British Transport Police and to move to a national infrastructure policing unit with the 
integration of VTP into the MOD policing and into civil nuclear policing, which would abolish VTP uh, completely. My concerns about that particular approach is that I suspect it would largely be an armed-based force, given the nature of the work which is carried out by civil nuclear officers and uh, Ministry of Defence Police Services. So I do recognise uh, that there are those who have concerns about the integration plans which we, we have here in Scotland. The replanning exercise is an important element of making sure the areas of work that still have to be carried out and completed before full integration takes place, that that replanning exercise identifies the timeline for taking that forward. But I don't share the member's view that we should <coughs> abolish BTP and move it into a national infrastructure policing uh, division in the way in which his party has proposed at the last election and was previously mooted by the UK government and is clearly the UK government's policy going forward at the present time. Question two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether Police Scotland has shared its experience of tackling knife crime with the Metropolitan Police. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Police Scotland routinely works in collaboration with other forces and recently hosted a visit from the Metropolitan Police to explore issues of common interest. This included a discussion of efforts to reduce violence and knife crime, areas where, as a member knows, Scotland continues to face challenges but has, through our public health approach, also made some significant progress. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Justice Secretary for that answer. Under this SNP government, knife crime has fallen by 69% in a decade from 10,110 incidents to 3,101, with an even steeper fall, 77% in my own area of North Ayrshire, having previously doubled under the Labour Lib Dem administration. Does he agree that having 6% more police on the streets under the SNP compared to a 17% 17% fall in England under the Tories has made a difference. And given the appalling tragedy of 39 young people stabbed to death in London so far this year, what further advice can the Cabinet Secretary give on how best to tackle this scourge? Can I write members, I quite like short questions, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, General Officer, the member is right to highlight the fact that uh, uh, crimes involving handling offensive weapons, weapons in Scotland has significantly reduced since 2006 uh, 7. However, uh, we know the devastating consequences which can come from uh, knife crime uh, within our own communities and we certainly in no way can afford to be uh, complacent about the progress which we have made. In my view, uh, one knife crime uh, will always be one too many. So alongside the very tough enforcement action which we have taken uh, in our approach to tackle knife crime, we've also had a very firm focus on prevention and early intervention, which has no doubt played a significant role in helping to reduce knife crime in Scotland, including to the levels which uh, the member made reference to in his own constituency. Uh, we've invested significantly in the National Violence Reduction uh, Unit, which has allowed us to make sure there's a clear focus on violence prevention. Uh, this has also included the development of Medics Against uh, Violence, a prevention programme uh, which has been delivered in uh, at some of our schools in Scotland and also the Mentors and Violence Prevention Programme which has now been delivered in schools across the country to teach young people about the, uh, the risks and the dangers um, of violent crime but also to promote healthy relationships and to help them keep safe. Alongside that, specifically on knife crime, we have the uh, No Knives Better Life Youth Engagement Programme, uh, which specifically aims to reduce the incidence of violence and knife carrying amongst young people. And this has now been delivered in 24 of our local authorities and is on track to be delivered in all 32 of our local authority areas this year. So, President Officer, as we have made good progress in the course of the last 10 years, I can assure members that we are absolutely focused on continuing to bear down on violence and in particular knife crime in Scotland and our prevention approach is one which we have reaped the benefits of in recent years and we will continue to invest in in the years to come. Question three, Willie Coffey. <coughs> Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress the Scottish Sentencing Council is making with guidelines on sentencing in relation to deaths caused by driving. Cabinet Secretary. The Sentencing Council is an independent body. However, my officials have been in touch with the Council in connection with this question and I can confirm that the Council have advised that a subcommittee has been established to consider the development of the guidance in relation to deaths by driving. This subcommittee will be responsible for the development of the guide guidelines, including considering the specific timing for development of the guideline, uh, with research, uh, what research will be needed and what data. Uh, presently available data is held. 
Uh, this area of law is, of course, reserved, and it's also worth noting that the UK government consulted in 2016 to changes to the maximum penalties for death by driving cases. And uh, then they announced in October 2017 that legislation would be introduced to increase the maximum penalties for certain death by death by driving offences. This announcement can, of course, be expected to impact on the timing of a development of the guidelines by the Scottish Sensing Council. Uh, Willie Coffey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He will be aware of the tragic case of my constituent, William Murray, who was killed as a result of a motorbike accident in 2013. The other person involved was convicted of careless driving, given a community sentence and banned from driving for five years, but flouted that ban last November and was given another community sentence. What assurance can be given to William Murray's family and other families that the justice system will take full account of previous convictions and recommend custodial sentences for repeat offenders under any new sentencing guidelines? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I'm aware of the case, having met with the uh, constituency member to discuss the matter, but you'll also pre appreciate that um, I'm uh, not able to comment specifically on any individual case, uh, although members will recognise that the courts uh, do take into account all of the relevant facts and circumstances when it comes to making decisions on uh, sentencing, and that includes uh, the fact that they are dealing uh, with someone who may be a repeat offender. Uh, of course, in any given uh, case, uh, these are decisions for the court to make, uh, informed by the information which is provided to them uh, by the prosecution and also by the defence. Uh, and I can understand why victims and their families are keen to understand how sensing decisions are made uh, and that uh, the, the, the reasons as to why uh, the court has come to a particular determination. And that's one of the reasons why transparency in sentencing uh, is important and why we establish the Scottish Sentencing Council uh, and why the work that it's taking forward will be important in encouraging greater transparency around sen sentencing decisions. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The publishing of sentencing guidelines for the first time this autumn represents a real opportunity to improve public understanding of sentencing and how it works. And while I recognise the independence of the Sentencing Council, can I ask what representations the government have been making to the Council so that we can ensure that guidelines uh, lead to transparent, understandable uh, sentencing and reflect the seriousness of the crime in general? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, as the member uh, mentioned in his own uh, question, is, is an independent body and responsible for taking these matters forward uh, on uh, the, in the manner in which it sees as being most appropriate. It does consult the Scottish Government on its draft business programme. However, the content of that is a matter for the Scottish Sentencing uh, Council. Uh, once they have completed the delivery of any uh, work to establish new uh, sentencing guidelines, it will then be a matter for the Scottish Sentencing Council to determine how they take that forward. I would expect that to be taken forward uh, in partnership with the judiciary, including the Lord President, in ensuring that our senators are aware of the new guidelines uh, once they have been implemented. And they can have uh, support in that work through the Judicial Institute, which is responsible for helping to support the training of their sentences. However, decisions in taking that forward is rightly a matter for the Scottish Sentencing Council. Uh, and I don't think it would be appropriate for government to start intervening in how they take these matters forward and also how they then disseminate that information once their work has been completed. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Sentencing Council was formed in October 2015, which is now two and a half years ago. Guidelines were promised on death by driving in October 2016, one and a half years ago, yet only now are we seeing some action. The SNP also promised action to crack down on drug driving last September after pressure from the Scottish Conservatives. So can I ask the Justice Secretary what progress has been made? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, clearly the member doesn't understand how the Scottish Sentencing Council operates on the basis of it's an independent body which is headed up by the Lord Justice Clark uh, with a range of experts uh, who are appointed to it for their purposes to support them in drafting guidelines for our uh, courts and our sentences. And the member may wish to reflect on that in understanding how it operates. In relation to uh, drug driving, the member will be aware, uh, although he may not be aware given that he was not a member of the parliament at the time when this decision was made, is that we made a decision on the basis of the recommendations that came in relation to both uh, drink and drug driving uh, about the priorities that we would set in adjusting uh, the existing uh, or the, the previous uh, drink driving rate or introducing uh, new provisions for drug driving. 
The UK government took an approach where they chose not to lower uh, the drink driving uh, limit in the way in which we chose to do so. We did that uh, and we now have the lowest drink driving uh, limit within the whole of the UK in order to promote greater safety on our roads. We said at that time, once that work had been completed and that had been embedded with Police Scotland operationally, we would then turn to the introduction of drug driving tests. That's exactly what has now taken, been taken forward uh, and that work has presently been undertaken <coughs> in partnership with Police Scotland. Once that work has been completed, Scotland will have the most robust uh, drink driving and drug driving limits in the whole of the UK. So I hope that helps member in understanding what was previously agreed here in Parliament and the approach which we are taking. And that's the important progress we are making in ensuring that our roads in Scotland are as safe as possible from those who too often uh, simply ignore uh, the safety risks which are associated with drink driving and also drug driving. Question four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to the concerns raised by Rate Crisis Scotland and others regarding the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Services changes to prosecution policy in cases of rape and sexual violence. Solicitor General. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Lord Advocate and I had a helpful and constructive meeting with Rape Crisis <coughs> Scotland on the 19th of April. And we have committed to work with them to provide reassurance in relation to how the policy will work in practice and ensure that victims can be given accurate information in that regard. We confirmed that the focus of the Crown's revised policy is not compelling rape complainers to testify. The focus is to ensure that the burden of prosecutorial decision making lies properly with the Crown and to ensure that decisions made uh, are made after the most careful consideration of all of the relevant circumstances. Because, presiding officer, the Crown is committed to doing all it can to prevent violence against women and girls and to protect the public from serious sexual violence. As prosecutors, we know only too well and understand the challenges which the criminal justice system uh, can present for complainers in rape cases. And that is why the Crown continues to work with others to address the features in the system which contribute to reluctance and witness attrition. Christina McKelvey. Yep. Can I thank the Solicitor General for, for that response and welcome the, the work, the ongoing work with Rape Crisis Scotland. I'm sure many of us in here will welcome uh, that work indeed. But is it the case that the Crown wouldn't take action against any complainer who failed to give evidence after a warrant was issued? And if it is the case, can the Scottish Government give me and Rape Crisis Scotland and others assurances that no rape complainer will be jailed if they are unable to give evidence even where a warrant is issued? Solicitor General. We can never exclude the possibility that there could be circumstances where a witness warrant might be sought if a complainer refused to attend at court when lawfully cited. And whilst we uh, accept that, we expect this would and could only arise in the most exceptional of circumstances, which I may say have not arisen in the time I have been prosecuting rape in the High Court for the last 10 years as a law officer, or indeed since the 12th of March, since the policy was clarified. Should that issue ever arise, before any decision was taken about the appropriateness of seeking a warrant in the first place, very careful consideration and assessment would be given by an, an experienced prosecutor to all the relevant factors in that individual case. The circumstances of the complainer, her vulnerabilities, the nature and reasons for her reluctance, and also, crucially, the nature and circumstances and gravity of the offence and the offender. Only after considering all of these uh, circumstances will any decision be taken. And I may say this will be a, an assessment which is one of many conducted through the entire process. So we will take careful account of the risks of not proceeding against a particularly dangerous accused. But the complainer's views, her welfare and her interests are at the heart of the Crown's prosecution policy in relation to reluctant complainers. The policy underlines the importance of exploring the reasons for that reluctance and of working along with other agencies to address those concerns where we can, to re-engage and to support that witness. But all of that means in practice 
is that there will continue to be cases where, taking account of all of these relevant circumstances, the right thing to do is not to take proceedings or to discontinue them. Now, I, can I say, I've only managed to get to question four, and I'm going to take two brief supplementaries on question four, but I want to say that it is important that not only, I say this to the entire chamber, that questions are short, but answers are succinct as well. I appreciate one has to be very careful, for particularly in justice issues, with the answers that are given, but to only reach question four. So I'd ask those who've been in here today speaking to look at the time they've been on their feet, because next time I'm in the chair for it, I will intervene if answers, as well as questions, are too long, in order that we can at least let other members get in. Because reaching question four is not good enough in my book. But I'll now take Kezia Dugdale on a supplementary night question. Please make it brief, to be followed by Margaret Mitchell with a brief supplementary, and please, short answers. Thank you. Can I ask the Solicitor General what further work is undertaken to support uh, rape victims during the court process with specific regards to the length of time it takes the cases to get to trial and indeed the number of delays that victims face? Solicitor General. Thank you. There's a lot of work going on, uh, most notably in relation to reduction of the pre-petition workload, which contributes to a delay, the journey time from report to trial. We have reduced the number of those cases from 700 in 2016 to 200 today. We continue to um, act on feedback from Rape Crisis Scotland directly on the, ex the lived experience of complainers and have changed our practices already in that regard. And we will continue to work with others in the system to address those system-wide features that contribute to, to delay and the other circumstances that contribute to reluctance and attrition. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, can I ask the Solicitor General uh, to confirm how many rape victims have applied for legal aid and been accepted um, to oppose the disclosure of sensitive, uh, sensitive medical re uh, records and also what advice the uh, Crown and Procurator Fiscal gives to these victims that this option is available? Solicitor General. I don't know the numbers and advice is given in that regard. Thank you, thank you very much. I apologise indeed to the five members not called. I trust I, I won't repeat this again. It means I can't call supplementaries if we are very long answers, and I don't want to cut out supplementaries in important questions. And now we move on to questions in culture, tourism and external affairs, question one. And that um, advice or telling off I've given pertains to the next set. I call Angus MacDonald, please. First question to ask the Scottish Government how much funding Event Scotland will receive in the current financial year. Cabinet Secretary. Event Scotland is part of uh, Visit Scotland's Events Directorate and as such it does not receive direct grant and aid funding from the Scottish Government. Its funding is an operational decision for the Visit Scotland Board. I will ask the Visit Scotland Chief Executive to um, write to the member with the details once the funding for 2018-19 has been agreed by the Visit Scotland Board. Mm. I can tell Mr Macdonald that in 2017-18 Event Scotland was allocated £9.3 million. Pounds. Angus Macdonald. Thank you. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response and uh, clearly welcome this year's funding. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the established uh, motorsport event, the Bowness Revival Classic Car Show and Hill Climb, held annually in my constituency. And over the past three years, it's received funding from Events Scotland's National Events Programme. However, there's a maximum limit of three awards from that fund. Um, does she agree that there's possibly a, 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 a a chance to, to perhaps mention to Event Scotland that, uh, that there could be a possibility of um, relaxing the three-year rule on a discretionary basis uh, to allow continued funding for events such as the Bowness Hill Climb. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I am aware of the Revival Classic Show and Hill Climb in Bowness, a, a, an important event. Uh, it would be a decision for uh, Visit Scotland if they were to relax that three-year funding. But of course, uh, that would mean if they had another year's funding for that organisation or indeed any others, it would mean less funding would be available for new events if existing events receive funding for a fourth year. But I do understand that the chairman of the Bowness Hill Climb had a productive meeting with Visit Scotland only on Monday and they are going to continue to provide non-funding support and advice to the event and he to help them develop a more sustainable commercial business uh, for the future. Future. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, to ask the Cabinet Secretary what percentage of funding will be allocated to events that will encourage diversity? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, if the member was listening to my very first answer, she'll be aware that the Scottish Government does not provide direct grant and aid to Events Scotland. The decisions about Events Scotland and the, indeed the distribution and indeed to which organisations are, are promoting diversity will be a decision for the Visit Scotland Board. Uh, but I will ask, as I, I replied to the first uh, question, I will ask Visit Scotland to advise the member uh, once they make that decision. Question two, Ivan McKee. To ask the Scottish Government what scope there is through its International Development Fund to support projects that are not in its four partner countries, Malawi, Rwanda, Zambia and Pakistan. Minister. Our new International Development Strategy, published in 2016, focused uh, our work on, as the member said, four partner countries, with which we have strong historic and contemporary links to ensure our £10 million International Development uh, Fund has the greatest impact. Scottish-based organisations working in any country whose human development scores medium or low on the current United Nations Human Development Index are, however, eligible to apply for our small grants programme for feasibility or capacity building grants of up to £10,000. Ivan McKee. I thank the Minister for that answer and I agree with the strategy of focusing on four countries to ensure maximum impact. However, retaining flexibility to fund projects in other countries enables us to respond to and support specific needs as they arise. As the Minister will be aware, I recently visited Palestine, a country badly in need of development support. I would like to ask the Minister if he would meet with me to discuss specific projects in the occupied West Bank that would benefit from some limited Scottish Government funding support. Minister. I'm more than happy, of course, uh, to, to meet the member, to hear uh, his, uh, his uh, concerns he wishes to raise around uh, uh, that issue. Um, I just want to mention, possibly in passing too, however, that uh, we have provided in the past one-off uh, funding, uh, humanitarian funding for Gaza, and also the <coughs> Scottish Government has sought to be helpful um, to firefighters in Scotland who are seeking to provide uh, or make sure a fire uh, engine made its way to Palestine to, to uh, assist people in that part of the world too. Question three, Jeremy Balfour. We present an officer to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Creative Scotland regarding the appointment of a head of a new screen unit. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the recruitment of the Executive Director of Screen and Creative Enterprise is a matter for Creative Scotland. Uh, Creative Scotland updates Scottish Government regularly about progress with the screen unit, including on recruitment at project board and screen committee meetings and at the routine meetings they have with sponsored department officials. I am also updated in meetings with them. Creative Scotland has invited the Scottish Government Director for Culture, Tourism and Major Events to sit on the selection panel. Yes, Jeremy Balfour, please. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for her answer? Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to regular meetings and will she also report back to this chamber of how those meetings go? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, uh, I have regular meetings with Creative Scotland. I actually, reg my, my communication to parliamentarians is normally via the convener of the relevant committee and indeed on the 8th of March. Uh, there was a letter from Creative Scotland to uh, that committee making sure that they were aware uh, of the developments and the progress. So if the member has a, a particular interest in following this, I suggest he might look at the, the papers and the publications that come from that committee as they are open to, to every parliamentarian in this committee. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary be aware, the Culture Committee has undertaken an inquiry into the screen sector, including scrutiny of the new screen unit. Is she confident that the governance arrangements under the head of the new screen unit will work, who will work underneath Creative Scotland are appropriate for meeting the specific needs of this sector? Uh, yeah, yes, Cabinet I, Secretary, uh, yes, I do. And indeed, in the letter that went to the, the committee itself, we, the, uh, and in my uh, response to the committee as well, in terms of my correspondence, we set out that one of the things that we think is absolutely crucial is that there are Creative Scotland board members appointed that have screen experience. Those adverts are about to, to go out. And also in terms of the governance, uh, lead members from within the screen sector themselves, uh, very respected members, will be part of that governance arrangement as well. And that's something that has given confidence to, to me, but also uh, to others in the screen sector. And I call the breathless number four, Bob Doris, who's just arrived in town. <coughs> I uh, certainly have, presiding officer, I, I, I apologise for getting my time is wrong, I know that was my responsibility, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports built heritage in the Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn constituency. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. 
The Scottish Government supports built heritage across our communities through the lead uh, public body Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, Mary, Hill, Mary Hill Borough Halls was restored in 2012 with help from public funds awarded by the former Historic Scotland and the Scottish Government. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I point out that Springburn has been blighted by the loss of a number of buildings of heritage over the years, but the A-listed Winter Gardens in Springburn Park remains a wonderful asset despite being on the buildings at risk register. The Springburn Winter Gardens Trust is making an ambitious large-scale heritage lottery fund bid to save and repurpose the Winter Gardens for future generations, a defining moment in the project's future. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to offer her best wishes for the bid and can I extend an invite to visit the Winter Gardens and hear more about these ambitious plans? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I certainly can provide my best wishes uh, for those uh, and the local trusts that are looking at the A-listed glass house in Springburn Park, the Winter Gardens there. Uh, I'm pleased that Historic Environment Scotland have managed to, to uh, maintain the repair grant scheme and the funding for that and provide up £14.5 million for a further year from the Scottish Government. Uh, and also the Glasgow City Heritage Trust can help fund these organisations. In terms of visiting, um, I'm very interested in our historic heritage in all parts of Scotland. And should my diary provide, I'd be very willing to come and see what was happening in Springburn. Question five, Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer. I'm obliged at this point to inform the Chamber that the First Minister has appointed me as Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, and I further wish to refer members to my register of interest, specifically my membership of the Musicians' Union, uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports participation in music. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government supports participation in music in many different ways. Uh, our long-standing investment of £100 million since 2007 uh, in the Youth Music Initiative has made a huge impact, uh, helping young people in all 32 local authorities access music-making opportunities, helping sure that every pupil is offered a year's free music tuition by the end of P6. A further £9 million of funding has been allocated to the initiative in 2018-19. We are providing £2.5 million to Systema Scotland as part of our four-year funding package in communities in Stirling, Glasgow, Aberdeen and Dundee. And we're also investing £22.5 million in our national performing companies this year. Uh, all have music content within their programmes and outreach programmes. We're providing uh, £10 million towards the new Edinburgh Impact Performance Venue, which will provide a home for the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and create of Scotland also work with a range of partners to ensure uh, people have the opportunity to participate in music and the recently announced regular funded network uh, includes strong support for all music genres from contemporary to jazz to classical to traditional. Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. For many people, their first experiences of participation in music occurs, of course, in school. Does the Cabinet Secretary um, share the concerns expressed by many musicians that children and young people will lose out on opportunities to participate in music making if some local authorities continue to reduce instrumental teaching services and increase tuition charges? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I am very concerned about the decision by some local authorities to cut access to instrumental music tuition, particularly at secondary level. Uh, the Deputy First Minister also shares my concerns. Uh, I have asked Scottish Government culture officials to work with education officials to assess the impact and identify ways, respecting the autonomy and responsibility local councils have for this, to work with key stakeholders to ensure that we do have a vibrant mu mu music tuition provision in the future to inspire the many young people who currently benefit from it. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary also share the concern about the proposals in West Lothian to cut certain instruments from free music tuition and to charge for tuition, um, which could lead to the detriment of disadvantaged children and the Council in West Lothian blaming the Scottish Government budget cuts for this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the member will be aware um, that local government as a whole in Scotland did have a, a real terms increase, and in particular, West Lothian has had an increase in its budget as well. I am very familiar with the situation in West Lothian. Now, my constituency is the Linlithgow constituency, and I think it's absolutely shocking in a <coughs> county where uh, it has been championed and, and regarded across Scotland as uh, providing some of the best of music tuition, that they would even contemplate uh, abolishing strings uh, tuition and also percussion tuition. I think at the intervention of the Children's Commissioner who identified that they hadn't even consulted children and young people about that provision, they are now looking again at that provision and I would urge them seriously to do so. It's not just the reputation of West Lothian Council as a music making champion that is severely at risk, it is the opportunities that young people in my constituency and across West Lothian face. Question six, Murdo Fraser. 
Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what work is being done to ensure that historic battlefields are preserved. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, historic Environment Scotland has a statutory duty to compile and maintain an inventory of historic battlefields of a national importance. The inclusion of a battlefield on the inventory means that particular consideration must be given to any impact on the site of any development or activity on it. The effect of a proposed development on inventory battlefields is a material consideration in the planning system. Scottish planning policy sets out the matters planning authorities should consider in determining planning applications relating to historic battlefields, including protecting, conserving and enhancing their key landscape characteristics and special qualities. A further layer of scrutiny is provided by a planning direction from 2012 which sets out when ministers have to be notified over planning proposals affecting historic battlefields and where development is not within the planning system, for example in forestry or trunk roads proposals, Historic Environment Scotland's policy statement sets out that public bodies should ensure nationally important battlefields are given consideration in their plans. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very comprehensive uh, response? She will know that the success of the Outlander books and TV series has caused a renewed interest in the Jacobite period. And yet, at the same time, two important Jacobite battle sites are being threatened by development, one being Culloden, the other being Killy Crankey in the area I represent, where plans by Transport Scotland to extend the A9 dual carriageway to the south would cover what is the most sensitive part of the battle site where most of the casualties were uh, incurred. This is particularly unfortunate as there is a viable alternative to extend the A9 to the north side with a lesser impact. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept that if these plans at Killikankri go ahead, then the protections that she just outlined in her answer will be exposed as worthless? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am aware of those two developments, in particular in relation to uh, the A9, uh, something that in terms of the development of which is something that uh, the Scottish Government is pursuing and I think will make a, a transformational difference to uh, the transport between uh, Inverness um, and the South. Uh, he will, however, be aware that in that particular instant, in, instance, Scottish Ministers uh, will be called upon to determine this case uh, in due course and it's not therefore appropriate for me to comment on the proposals or indeed the objections that have been raised, but he will be aware that Historic Environment Scotland themselves as part of the process I outlined in, his, in my original answer, have already made their concerns about the issue known. Question 7, Peter Chapman. Government, what action it is taking to encourage more tourists to visit Orkney and Shetland? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government fully recognises the importance of tourism to the economies of both Orkney and Shetland, the numerous attractions of our Northern Isles, for example UNESCO sites of Neolithic Orkney and Jarlsoff on Shetland are actively promoted by Visit Scotland through its many marketing campaigns. They are also directly support the sector to ensure that they maximise the potential from tourism. Other public bodies also play a key role, uh, Highlands and Isles Enterprise uh, and also Historic Environment Scotland and Scottish National Heritage promoting and enhancing the areas of natural environment and also recognising that the popularity of sites on the islands and other rural areas brings challenges to public infrastructure. We launched the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund last year to address these issues and one of the fund's pilots announced last month was £80,000 towards car parking at the Stones of Stennis, providing much needed facilities at a popular, popular Neolithic site. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In its 2016 manifesto, the SNP pledged to reduce ferry fares on services to Orkney and Shetland. Now, last year, the Minister stated that these fare reductions would be rolled out in the first half of 2018, saving visitors up to £100. With only 10 weeks until this time frame ends, surely the government has some plan in place, or is this just another SNP broken promise? Cabinet Secretary. Can I politely point out to the member that I am the Tourism Secretary, I'm not the Transport uh, Minister. The Transport Minister, I can reassure the member, is actively involved in this issue uh, and I'm sure would be more than happy to update the member appropriately. But it's, uh, I think he should be taking the opportunity here and now in tourism questions to champion Orkney and Shetland, the wonderful uh, sites that they have, instead of complaining uh, about uh, an issue that he knows that I can't answer. Liam MacArthur. 
Thank you. Can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for giving a tour de force of the tourist attractions in my own uh, constituency as well as Shetland, but can I ask her to join with me in impressing upon her colleague, the Transport Minister, who will be in Orkney and Shetland uh, this Friday and Saturday, to come armed with a time frame for the delivery of the uh, road equivalent tariff that has been promised for our life, lifeline ferry services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, can I say we have a very proactive and committed transport and islands minister who takes every opportunity to make sure that uh, departments across government know of the importance of transport links and indeed uh, the importance of tourism and the island economies as well. So I'm sure, as I've just replied to the previous member, that we will be able to make sure that he is updated appropriately. But again, for the second time, I can tell him that the transport minister is actively engaged in this issue and will co communicate at the appropriate time as he has a responsibility for ferries. I'm afraid that concludes uh, questions, portfolio questions on culture and tourism and I apologise to the three members I was unable to call but it was a darn sight better than the previous session. Thanks to, thanks to the questions and the short answers. We'll have a short break as we move on to the next item of business.